first allow me to thank you very much for uh, you know your kind invitation uh, for me to join this um, side event <clears throat> i would like to begin this presentation by by giving us a brief uh, context uh, which i think may, may many of us are already familiar with but i think it's worth recalling so uh, we'll go directly to the next slide and as we all know global warming is set to increase um, rapidly in the next decades the IPCC has set out a target of limiting the increase in global average temperature to two degrees within the next few decades. However, more recently, we have heard about efforts uh, made by, by some countries which aim to limit this increase to 1.5 degrees. And that is most welcome. So we know that for countries like in South Asia, like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, these countries are especially vulnerable and could see extreme increases in heat and, and humidity. Conversely, we know that uh, rising sea levels in uh, mega deltas uh, <clears throat> will displace a large coastal population and impact food production. By, by 2050, parts of Asia may see heat waves, extreme rainfall events, severe hurricanes, drought, change in water supply. In South Asia only, the increase in temperature may be as much as three to four times higher than the average um, uh, global warming. So at the same time, drought is becoming much more frequent in, the, in this region, already facing very serious water shortages. So in order to avoid such drastic changes in our climate, clearly we must act, act now and start formulating a plan for uh, global carbon neutrality and the importance of this side event, in my opinion. This is the only way for us to avoid the tipping points that could spell disaster for life as we know it on the planet. The good news, uh, uh, despite this, this terrible scenario, uh, the good news is that we are still on time and, uh, and, and to get this right. So as the CGIR, we are convinced that food systems are part of the solution. They can be a major part of this solution globally. And the CGIR has gathered tons of data, uh, experiences and lessons learned from various centers uh, across the, the, the various regions of the world, from CGIR research program, especially the one on climate change, agriculture and food security called CCAF. We can make all that information and experience available to the global community to meet the Paris Agreement, finally. So uh, allow, me, allow me to introduce very briefly the, the work that we are setting out as the one CGIR. Uh, in this slide, uh, I try to present our strategic goals as a unified CGIR to achieve positive and measurable benefits uh, across the five impact areas that you see on top of on the right side hand, top of the, this slide. The five impact areas that are nutrition, health, and food security, poverty reduction, livelihood, and jobs, gender uh, equality, youth, and social inclusion the topic of the day, climate adaptation and mitigation, and environmental health and diversity. These are five impact areas that are collective global targets are clearly intertwined and need to be addressed simultaneously. These impact areas will be targeted through CGIR, so-called CGIR impact pathways, which are, as you can see here in the green, spot, green part of this chart, capacity development, very important in, 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 in the global south in particular, innovation, which includes technological advances, but also institutional and policy innovation, and finally, policy change. We, 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 uh, we, this will be done through a performance and research management framework that is very ambitious. And, and these impact pathways will be delivered by the CGIR, unified CGIR through regional and global initiatives that are facilitated by country and regional engagement, very important engagement at the country level in particular. So, 
there are three main action areas that the one CGIR wants to focus on. System transformation, as you can see on, uh, on the slide, uh, recent, resilient um, agri-food systems, <clears throat> and genetic innovation. While these action areas stand independently, they are, they are very important linkages. And so interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches are absolutely fundamental. For example, we need to address trade-offs and make sure that we cover the various you know, linkages, such as improving resilience, that need to go hand in hand with selecting crop traits, for example, that consumer prefer, as well as reversing forest loss and degradation. I will go faster on these on the top uh, bottom part, which are really the, the 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 ways of working that are very common. So you know, building uh, uh, on on system transformation, strategic alliance, multiple pathways, and and uh, innovative finance, digital revolution. So these principles are key for the CGIR to operate, you know, uh, more effectively and and increase its performance and efficiency, while bringing best in class um, uh, expertise, I would say, and capabilities. So. For these initiatives, in particular the regional ones, we will engage with our partners at the country level at various stages of the development of all our programs, you know, from, from initial design to implementation and result assessment. This will help us as CGIR to measure uh, our impact at the country level and refine our research models to inform future work uh, for ourselves, but also for our partners. So that's briefly what I wanted to say. One more slide to actually show that with one CGI amazing research, uh, we have defined a, a research and development and innovation strategy that aims to prioritize, you know, uh, some uh, clear uh, uh, programs and actions, uh, activities uh, towards our objective to achieve sustainable development goals, to achieving sustainable development goals by 2030. So our framework, as we saw earlier, is all about that. Uh, making sure that we make substantial contribution to our, our 2030 sustainable development goals. So for the 2022-2024 business plan period, our, our prospectus proposes a set of initiatives that builds on the, the track records of the CGI in the last 50 years, in, especially in, in Asia, where we have made you know, uh, substantial uh, breakthroughs in terms of scientific innovations. Uh, to accelerate, you know, the impact uh, that we can have to improve people's life and, and restore ecosystems. So here, this next slide and, and the following one provide a little bit of an overview of the initiatives I was referring to, to our uh, action area. So these initiatives are placed in the, the uh, each, um, you know, uh, major action areas. So I, I, I recall system transformation, resilient agri-food systems, or genetic innovation. Uh, and so most initiatives will involve collaboration across more than one action area. So we really look at these interlinkages and <clears throat> to actually make sure that we address the multifaceted faceted nature of these challenges, you know, uh, uh, not addressing food security independently from issues related to equity, for example, or environmental health or biodiversity or climate change. So these need to be seen as a system approach. So here I'm, 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 I'm trying to depict the six, uh, you know, uh, of the three, uh, 33 current CGIR initiatives, especially the ones that are called regional integrated initiatives. Which these will ensure that we, have, we adopt an integrated response to local demands, uh, especially when it comes to addressing climate change. Uh, and so we have uh, regional integrative, uh, integrated initiatives in all six regions that the CGI has defined. For the regions that is, is in Asia, uh, we have one that is called mega deltas. So addressing climate change in, in mega delta, uh, addressing the multi-dimensional uh, challenges uh, through uh, innovative research to make sure that we provide um, actionable solutions to our uh, partners, especially governments. So I would like now to turn to, to your attention to the, an initiative that is particularly uh, 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 relevant uh, to the, the side event that we have, uh, we have today, and that is called the Initiative on Transforming Food System from Greenhouse House Sources. As we all know, agriculture is a major uh, source of emission uh, to uh, transforming food system to become carbon sinks. 
it adopts the logic of the Paris Agreement, uh, which states that finance flows need to support low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So this initiative will demonstrate that targets can be achieved by food system approach that reduces emissions and in end sinks to, uh, to, to achieve this vision. So it's very important to see food system also as part of the solution. In addition, this S2C um, initiative builds on national determined contributions and integrates an inclusive living labs approach to stimulate creative uh, innovations. We, we, we do that um, by testing and demonstrating what we could call social technical advances, approaches, business model, as well, and this is very important, governance arrangements to low emission pathways under real world scenarios. So this is not an academic exercise. Uh, so in terms of trade policy and governance, for example, there is recent evidence, as we have heard during the COP26 here, uh, uh, evidence that uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer accounts for nearly 2.5% of global emissions, while the synthetic uh, nitrogen fertilizer supply chain, for its part, accounts for about 20% of annual um, direct emissions from agriculture. <laughs> and we need to note that the, four top, the top four emitters, you know, account alone for about 60% of the total emission associated with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So as part of the national determined contributions, many countries are already making real efforts to make fertilizer production processes more efficient uh, and less em emitting. However, if companies in one country, for example, uh, manage to reduce emissions, a part of this you know, production process, it could lead to higher fertilizer prices, leading to incentive to import from other countries with lower production standards, for example, or, and lower prices. Or it could shift production to other countries altogether. So these, these carbon leakages, as they are named, uh, uh, need to be prevented. And this is why policy and governance arrangements are very needed. Hence, the, 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 the very important uh, um, discussions that we're having as part of the global COP26, but also today in this side event. So these initiatives, as to see, builds to uh, help through the CGIR program on climate change uh, uh, to incorporate lessons that we have learned about how what has worked and what has not worked or what has not been uh, delivered yet, but uh, learning uh, on how we could do better to actually make sure that we promote change, real change uh, um, at the technical, institutional, policy governance level. So it combines very, very relevant data generation and modeling uh, 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 techniques uh, with sequencing actions on the ground for proof and concept and quick gains. So uh, this will be the focus for the period 2022-2024. Uh, uh, Upscaling will be more during the period 2025-2027, and outscaling uh, will be for, uh, seen during the period, expected to be seen during the period 2028-2030. So, so this, this I, I think, illustrates the ambition of the one CGIR with respect to its program on, on climate change and carbon neutrality. Another uh, very good example is the, what I have already mentioned, this program, a research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, or otherwise called CCAF. Uh, uh, this one leverages the diverse expertise of scientists across the CGIR. And, and we, are near, we are nearly 10,000 scientists that are are working, you know, as, as, as a big team. So research, these research teams focus on the relationship between agriculture and the environment uh, and, and explore initiatives to find the balance between the two. So how is it that we can combine a more virtuous circle about agricultural production, production and environmental protection? So this, this revolves around these, these key, key uh, uh, um, areas. Priorities and policy for climate smart agriculture, climate smart technology and practices, also building and learning from uh, uh, community-based practices uh, and learning points, low emission development, climate service and safety nets, very important to accompany uh, the progress that some communities and, and households need to do, gender and social inclusion, and scaling, scaling climate smart agriculture. 
So, so here I, I, I would like to give you an idea of the work that we have done uh, as, at, at ERI. I am also the director general of ERI on top of being, you know, as you have seen on the first slide, the, the regional director of the one CGIR for Southeast Asia and the Pacific. So I, I would like to share some of the best practices that we have developed over the years, and, and that will be relatively quick. So there is a lot, a lot to mention, but I would like to highlight five uh, examples. First is, is the, 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 the fact that we have devised an effective measurement, reporting, and verification, uh, so-called MRV, of emissions toolbox. And this is a, a data sharing platform that serves as an accessible reference for the planning and implementation of, of low uh, carbon technology. And, and, and these technologies uh, include uh, some of uh, those uh, you see here, like suitability mapping. Uh, you, you can see um, uh, also, uh, for example, uh, these tools that help identify areas of implementation for specific agricultural interventions, innovations and in technology, such as uh, the so-called alternate wetting and drying for rice production. Very, very important in, in, in South uh, Asia uh, and Southeast Asia. We also, have, um, we also have come up with an emission uh, calculator, uh, which measures uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, providing baseline data uh, for planning and, and implementation of climate smart intervention. All, all these underpin bigger efforts uh, under the, the, the CCAF umbrella, which include uh, climate smart maps and adaptation plan. So to give you an idea, in, in 2019, these maps and plans have helped to adjust the rice planting calendar uh, to avoid salinity intrusion brought by uh, the, the El Nino in 2019 in the Mekong uh, River Delta, and that uh, that cover more than 600,000 hectares. So, so this is massive, and, and it makes a difference. So, these, these the use of climate smart maps uh, help in avoiding the recurrence of major rice production loss, you know, which happened in 2016 already and then after. And it saved, it saved more than 200,000 hectares affected by salinity intrusion and more than 1 million tonne of rice loss. So all these initiatives are work to provide knowledge and solutions that can sustainably increase climate change resilience and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in food insecure communities. And this is really what the one CGIR is, is, is targeting. Um, so, uh, before I finish, uh, uh, finally, uh, you know, I, I want to say a few words about the, the new engagement model of the one CGIR. So, to improve our efficiency, as I have start, uh, stated at the beginning, you know, and, and improve our, our reach, you know, we are also undergoing an ambitious reform that will bring uh, thousands of scientists closer together. Uh, to respond in a, in a more um, uh, systemic manner to the complex challenges of food system transformation, where trade-offs uh, we need to be uh, duly uh, uh, dealt with. As part of this, um, of this important you know, work journey, I would say, that we are also rethinking our partnerships uh, models. This is crucial because it is uh, through partnerships with our Chinese partner, with our ASEAN partners, with uh, South uh, Asian uh, partners, and so on, uh, that uh, uh, in the public and the private sector, with civil society and academia, that the, the CGI will manage to um, really achieve this cutting edge research and generate the required knowledge, make sure that these uh, innovations are not only developed, but also scaled and implemented uh, and that we are going to also facilitate their adoptions with very uh, strong partnership. This is the sine qua non condition. So it is through partnership that the CGI are engaged in national, regional, and global platforms, fora, uh, and also in, in policy processes uh, and high-level policy dialogue to influence perhaps what is needed the most, as we have seen in the, in the COP26 already, you know, policy shifts making sure that we change the incentive structure, that we actually reorient investments and improve uh, underground practices. So currently the CGIR is, is engaging in, in an estimated 2,000 partnership with advanced research institutes, but also 
uh, national agencies, international NGOs, and, and national NGOs, uh, the private sector, as I said, and funding agencies, of course, to mobilize you know, all the, the, the financial resources that are needed to advance the ambitious research agenda. And, and, and we hope to, to use this opportunity with you to actually reach out to new partners. So we believe that effective engagement with partners is the bedrock of a food secure and environmentally sustainable future for all through a land, food and water system transformation in a climate crisis. So um, I, 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 really, I really want to finish by saying that the holistic policy engagement and advocacy where the CGIR can really leverage its research results, uh, proven research results, and reputation as a very honest broker uh, in global policy fora and processes to advance changes in the way um, food is grown, uh, uh, gathered, transported, processed, traded, stored, consumed, uh, and, and disposed uh, across key regions of the world, these are these are the key challenges that we want to engage with our partners. So I, 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 let me end here. I'm looking forward to to, to hearing from you about these these thoughts. Uh, it had to be quick. It is our hope that we will be able to to engage more uh, regularly with with a variety of stakeholders from different sectors in order to work collaboratively uh, together uh, to achieve our regional and global carbon neutrality. This is our ambition. And in doing so, uh, so, we hope to provide a safe uh, or safer future uh, for the generation to come. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, now uh, because of the technical problem, uh, uh, the other speakers will share another screen to have a talk. Uh, um, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Um, next, let's welcome to um, Dr. Chen Jinzhou to share his knowledge about the carbon neutrality. Let's welcome Dr. Chen Jinzhou. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry for the technical problem. Uh, this topic is regarding the half degree less warming measures for the risk reduction of extreme events. For the background of this work, we know in the Paris Agreement, we have two global warming levels. The first is a two degree, another is aiming for 1.5 degree. One question here you might ask is, there is only half a degree difference between these two warming levels. So are there any difference in the climate impact of such kind of difference? Uh, here, I will show, quickly show some examples for the extreme precision. And here are some pictures from the media. For the flooding occurred in 2018 in Japan, in Germany this year, and also uh, in part of China. Uh, here, we will focus on the extreme precipitation in the monsoon area. Uh, you can find the monsoon area is designated uh, as the contrast. It uh, covers a large part of the population. Based on the estimation, about two-thirds of the world population are affected by monsoon. And here is a special pattern of extreme precipitation. You can find the extreme precipitation has a large contribution to the rainfall in the monsoon area. So here, I will try to answer one question. How about the changes of extreme precipitation under 1.5 and 2 degree of global warming? To answer this question, we need the result of climate projections. The data we used is from IPCC Air 5. In addition, we also use the populations for different scenarios is called SSP. 
How about the result? And here is the projected changes of extreme precipitation and the time series. You can find an increase over most part of the world. Uh, and here I show the changes of the extreme precipitation. What I use here is a once in 20 year event in the current world and also in the future world under 1.5 degree warming, 2 degree, 3 degree, and even 4 degree. Please note here the colder colors mean will be a have a shorter return period. That means the extreme event will occur more frequently. You can find the current once in 20 year event in the current world will be once in 18 years under 1.5 degree of global warming. However, under 4 degrees of global warming, it will be once in 10 year event. So following the global warming, the frequency of the extreme event will be increased. How about the changes of the explorers? Here, please focus on this. Here is the land exposure to the extreme precipitation. This color is for the once in 10 year event. If global warming increase from zero up to four degree, you can find the land exposure to the extreme will increase. We can find a similar story for the once in 20 year event. And here is the exposure of population in the monsoon world under different scenarios. You can find following the increase of global warming from one to four degree, the exposure of the population to extreme event will also increase. We can also measure the avoided impact. And here is the difference between global warming at two degree and the five, 1.5 degree relative to the current state. And here are the results of the avoided impact for the land exposure. For example, if we focus on the once in 10 year event, you can find also we only have half a degree difference. However, the avoided impact will be more than 20%. If we examine the avoided impact for the population exposure, you can find the avoided impact ranges from 20 to 30%. This applies to all the scenarios. We can also extend the examination to other regions, such as the monsoon region in North Africa, South Asia, East Asia, and part of South America. Here you can find over many parts of the monsoon area, the avoided impact will be larger than 20%. This applies to both once in 10 year event and also once in 20 year event. This is a case for extreme precipitation. Finally, I will also show examples for the record breaking extreme or heat events. Uh, actually, we have checked the avoided impact for four kinds of record breaking events. Due to the time limit, I will only show this case. It's for the record breaking extreme hot event occurred in 2015 over Africa. And here is the observed surface air temperature uh, occurred in the year 2015. It's record breaking over many parts of the African area. You can find the surface air temperature is above nearly 2 degree, 1.5 degree. By using climate models, we can examine the probability of such kind of event in the current world, in a future world under 1.5 degree and in the future world under two degree of global warming. We can calculate the probability of such kind of event. And the result is given here. You can find if global warming achieves 1.5 degree, the probability of such kind of event will be 91%. In a future warming world of two degree, the probability will be 100%. So you can find only half a degree difference. The probability of the record breaking event will increase. To make a summary, based on all this evidence, I highlight the half degree less warning indeed matters for the risk reduction 
of extreme events like the dangerous precipitation extremes in the monsoon world and also the record-breaking heat extremes uh, in the African area. That's all for my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhou. Uh, next, uh, uh, let's welcome the doctor. Okay, next uh, let's welcome the Dr. Chen Ying to share her knowledge about the carbon neutrality. And because of the time limit, uh, everyone has five minutes to share um, their PowerPoints and knowledges. Um, hello, Dr. Chen, are you ready? Yes, uh, I'll share my, my PPT. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, it's my great pleasure to attend uh, the workshop. Uh, since the limited time, I'm just uh, 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 to share the main points. My my presentation will focus on the green and the low carbon development transition in China towards uh, carbon dioxide peaking and the uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, as we know, uh, last year, President Xi Jinping announced uh, at UN uh, General uh, Assembly the carbon peaking and the carbon neutrality targets. Uh, China has just uh, upgraded the NDCs. Uh, as we, uh, uh, Professor Zhou has just uh, uh, mentioned uh, the, the temperature. Uh, we are approaching the 1.5 degree rapidly. And uh, uh, according to IPCC AR6 uh, Working Group 1 report, uh, limiting human-induced global warming to a specific level require limiting uh, cumulative carbon dioxide emissions reaching at least uh, net zero uh, emissions. Uh, uh, but uh, currently, there are large emission gaps. Uh, UNEP has just uh, released a report, uh, the, the gap, uh, and the two degree target, the, the gap is 11 to 13. Uh, GT CO2, but for 1.5 uh, scenario, the gap uh, is even larger, uh, 25 to 28 uh, GT um, CO2. Um, um, uh, for China, uh, I, I think there are at least uh, uh, some stress uh, statistic uh, considerations be behind uh, the carbon peaking and carbon neutrality target. Uh, first uh, is the international responsibility. But uh, uh, I, I'd like to emphasize uh, carbon peaking and carbon neutrality target fits our own, own demands. Uh, our uh, domestic demands on uh, sustainable development. Uh, carbon peaking and carbon neutrality targets will have some synergies to promote a high quality economic development, uh, social prosperity, and to protect uh, our uh, uh, environment. Uh, so there are many uh, synergies. Uh, on the other side, uh, China are facing great, uh, great challenges and uh, uh, the transition risk. Um, China is the largest developing country, uh, la 
we'll, we have to achieve the largest uh, reduction from the carbon peaking to carbon neutrality. And we have to uh, achieve the, the target uh, within uh, uh, 30 years. Um, Ch uh, China's uh, energy mix, the, the share of coal um, is still 58.6%. Uh, uh, and the uh, coal burning uh, power uh, occupied uh, about 68% uh, last, in last year. So uh, to, uh, to change the uh, industrial uh, structure and the uh, energy system transition uh, is a big uh, challenge for, for China. Uh, uh, there are many policies and measures uh, released uh, uh, recently uh, 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 from the uh, central government level. Uh, two import, very important documents has just uh, released uh, uh, several uh, several days ago. Uh, but uh, also at the local uh, uh, local level or uh, the companies, uh, many state owned uh, enterprises have put forward their uh, carbon picking and carbon neutrality targets. Uh, uh, I uh, I also see uh, a lot of uh, innovative solutions of companies. Uh, many companies uh, actively engage in uh, to find their own ways to achieve the carbon picking and carbon neutrality targets. Uh, I also want to mention the uh, carbon neutrality in in Olympic game. Uh, which is coming soon, uh, uh, next year. For time limited, I just stop here. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, next should be the Dr. Ke Jun Zhang. However, due to the time conflicts, he couldn't to attend this meeting. Uh, but his assistant will represent him to make a talk. Let's welcome Dr. Wen. Chen He. Hi, you ready? Hi, Dr. He. Hi, Dr. He. Yeah. Um, to sharing this my PPT. Yeah. Um, your voice is a little bit low. Can you um, turn up your voice, please? Okay, I, I can use uh, the handphone. Maybe that will help. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Hi. I have no voice here. Oh, maybe you can turn up the voice. Um. Can you uh, see the um, PPT now? Yeah, we can see the PPT. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm He Chiming from Peking University. I'm sorry, Dr. Zhang cannot make this uh, um, today. And uh, I'm here to give uh, um, this presentation on behalf of uh, our, our team. Um, thank you for the post. 
And uh, today my topic is the China's energy and uh, economic uh, transition with the carbon neutrality target. Um, and this figure is from the IPCC 1.5 um, degree special report to show the global CO2 emissions um, will reach uh, zero emission between 2050 and 2060 um, under the SSP 1.9 scenarios. And uh, as we all know, China's uh, President Xi Jinping uh, announced uh, um, the national targets in September last year that uh, China's CO2 emission will peak before 2030 and will make effort to be carbon neutrality before 2060 in China. And this figure shows the CO2 emission in China uh, as the um, model result from our team. And we also published our um, paper about the 1.5 degree scenario um, for China in 2018. Um, within the uh, result, sorry, within the result, we can see that uh, under 1.5 degree scenario, China's CO2 emissions will um, be uh, near zero emission by 2050. Here uh, shows some um, detail uh, results of the 1.5 degree scenario. First is the total primary energy um, shows that uh, uh, the percentage of uh, non-fossil uh, fuel energy will be around uh, 75% um, in 2050, which is uh, similar uh, with uh, some other uh, modeling team in China, um, but uh, we have a um, more optimistic uh, uh, assumption of the uh, nuclear uh, energy. We can see that from the power generation, uh, the nuclear generation in um, 2050 will be around 30% uh, of the total power generation. And for the CO2 emissions in power sector, uh, that will uh, reach zero emission before 2050 and then um, be negative emissions uh, with the CCS uh, in both bioenergy and uh, fossil fuel based uh, power generation. And we also then consider the um, impact uh, on economic development uh, for the deep cut of uh, greenhouse gases, um, the overall impact in economic development pattern. And uh, there will be strong transition in the energy supply industry, uh, and also the transition are needed in end use sectors. And for some sectors uh, that is difficult to do the deep cut of uh, GHGs, uh, some new uh, manufacturers process are needed. Uh, this all will be uh, discussed uh, later. And uh, we also have some interesting findings that uh, mitigation of GHGs may increase the GDP in China, which is uh, uh, different uh, from some other researchers. And also China's overseas investment are increasing rapidly. Uh, here I give some um, detailed uh, results uh, for the sectors. This one shows the energy demand in uh, transport sector uh, that the electricity and the hydrogen will increase uh, firstly, uh, first uh, uh, soon in the near future. And uh, of course, the uh, petroleum demand will decrease rapidly. And uh, uh, in our model, we assume the uh, this uh, low carbon technology will uh, have first uh, development, but I'll, because of the time, I'll just uh, escape here. Like the electric uh, vehicles, uh, electric buses, electric heavy duty truck, fuel cell truck, 
electric airplane, electric ship. And in the, uh, then in the um, building uh, sector, the low carbon uh, technologies in building sector uh, even developed uh, faster than our expectation at the first. Uh, we can see that from the um, from the uh, popularizing uh, popularizing uh, rate, uh, for example, like the LED lights and uh, uh, the high efficiency air conditions and so on. These uh, figures gives it the uh, final energy demand result in. Uh, in building sector, including urban household, uh, rural household, and uh, uh, tertiary sector. Uh, within all these three parts, we can see that electricity will uh, play the key role in the future. Uh, that shows the electrification will be the most important uh, measure for the um, building sector to achieve the um, zero emission in the future. Now also, as mentioned, uh, uh, for the uh, industry, for some industry and uh, transport sectors, that is uh, difficult to achieve uh, zero emission uh, with the deep cut uh, uh, of GHGs, um, the significant transition, which is hydrogen-based process, will be needed. Uh, these sectors will include uh, steel making, ammonia, um, benzene, acetylene, ma methanol, clinker, heavy duty, and transport and airplane. Um, this is the figure shows the uh, model result of uh, hydrogen demand. We can see that the hydrogen demand will increase uh, rapidly after 2030 and even um, accelerate after 2040. Uh, we also want to know whether the economic development map will be changed by location uh, because of the renewable energy or nuclear energy, which are will be uh, very cheap in the near future. So we do this uh, product output uh, analyzed by provinces. The first one shows the historic data in 2018, and the second one shows the um, model results, uh, scenario results in 2015. Uh, we can see this. Uh, um, we can see these uh, um, uh, manufacturers obviously um, have sh well shifted from the eastern coastal area to the inland area, and also the hydrogen. And last but not least, uh, um, as mentioned, we our model team have a very um, optimistic uh, attitude of the nuclear energy um, in our model result that the cost of uh, nuclear power will be lower than um, 0.25 UM per kilowatt hour by 2035. That means at that time, it will be very competitive uh, at that time. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. He. Uh, next, let's welcome Dr. Xu Yinglong. You ready? Um, because of the time limit, we only have um, less than 10 minutes to share the knowledge. So everyone has five minutes to talk. Uh, can you can you see the the shared screen? Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to have a brief introduction on the carbon neutral uh, 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 a pilot case study in China. Uh, Well, you know, tea is a typical uh, non-alcohol beverage uh, in, uh, in China, even all over the world. Uh, it, it is a typical Chinese 
uh, culture. Uh, the methodology we used for the uh, emission accounting uh, is uh, from the uh, cradle to grave uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, from the cultivation, processing, packaging, and transportation, and consum uh, consumption, and the disposal. Uh, uh, actually, uh, this year, in the 21st of May, uh, we published a report on carbon neutral tea. Uh, uh, it's on, uh, uh, actually, uh, it's just on uh, our uh, pilot uh, uh, study uh, in these three uh, uh, pilot uh, uh, key gardens. Uh, uh, then, uh, a little bit later, we applied our working experience in Liu Bo in the uh, uh, Western Tea uh, production area in Shanxi province. Uh, that's the uh, figures for the uh, field sampling uh, for tea growth uh, uh, for sale and tea biomass for the four uh, uh, pilot uh, tea gardens. Then it's a result for the greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission for the four uh, pilot uh, uh, tea gardens. We, we can see that processing is uh, 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 is a big component of the total uh, uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission. And uh, based on the uh, studies in the pilot gardens, then uh, we calculated uh, the uh, 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 the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, for the tea production, uh, all of the main, uh, uh, mainland, uh, totally there are six, uh, 16 uh, provinces. Uh, for the results for the, uh, in the provincial greenhouse emission, uh, for the tea production, uh, consumption and cultivation are the big components. And uh, it's the ranking for the uh, for the uh, uh, carbon emission uh, of the, the intensity. Uh, it's the uh, mitigation scenario uh, for the uh, carbon neutral tea uh, in different uh, time stage. Actually, for the uh, uh, carbon sink in the soil, uh, then uh, uh, there, uh, it takes about 14% uh, uh, of the total emission. So we need to have the offset measures to mitigate the uh, 80 uh, uh, eighty six uh, percent uh, of the emission. Then, for uh, from our working experience, actually we uh, actually we uh, uh, link the uh, carbon neutral uh, carbon neutrality of agricultural production with the uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, under the su suggestions uh, uh, for the uh, data archiving and uh, the ways for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and uh, uh, how to uh, take the advantage of the carbon sink uh, and the, uh, for the, uh, the carbon neutral tea certification uh, how to do. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Uh, next, let's welcome Dr. Qing to speak. Uh, 
Okay, Annie, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, I guess I don't have enough time to actually go through all the uh, all the slides I have. So as one of the uh, organizers of this side event, I want to sh sh uh, thank you, all of you and the participants and our dis uh, speakers for being here and for joining us on this uh, side event. Uh, so I'm not, I'm going to skip my slides. I don't know if uh, Dr. Jones here, if he wants to see anything about this side event. Okay, let me see. So I guess I have a minute. Okay, uh, again, I want to thank you all in case it's just in any, any time. So uh, my talk is actually about nature-based climate solution. So nature has a lot of potential, but the question is not any a lot of nations actually doing anything to kind of use a forest or grassland to uh, capture uh, carbon dioxide. So that potential may not be released at all. What I, my information here is basically saying that we have to act fast and act now. So for the forest, grassland, and every culture that actually uh, sequester carbon dioxide, and also uh, to mitigate climate. So this is some of the work we are doing here. Uh, we have been working on uh, several ends. So for example, the energy emissions reduction, uh, land and ocean-based climate solutions, and together with some of the traditional and also uh, new techniques for uh, those efforts. So we have land and ocean-based uh, observations, remote sensing, and the most importantly, we have earth system modeling to be involved in this kind of efforts. So I guess we are done for time here, or should I just keep continuing? I think. I see Dr. Chen said we can have a, a screenshot of everyone. That's a good idea. Let's do this instead. Let's have a screenshot. Okay. Are we done with that? Yeah. Uh, 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 Okay. Okay, 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 okay. 周老师是我们这边是未来地球这个助理